morning we are in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter number 2. Ephesians chapter 2. We will read responsively. I will read the odd verses and let's read the even verses together please. So Ephesians chapter number 2. We will read from verse 1 down to verse number 10. Ephesians Chapter number 2, verse number 1, and the Bible says, And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we had our conversation in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the, of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherein he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Again, Lord, we do thank you that we can gather here together as your people on this Sunday morning. Thank you, Lord, for this season. Thank you, Lord, that you became flesh and dwelt with us. Uh, thank you, Lord, that as Christians we have hope because of what you did. Please meet with us in a special way, Lord. I pray that we would not just be challenged, but we would be changed to be a little bit more like you. Be with Pastor as he preaches, all of us as we listen. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. 
the babe, the son of Mary. All right, we are in Ephesians chapter number two this morning, as we our last Sunday before uh, Christmas, and if we're not careful when it comes to Christmas, we we don't understand the, the purpose of it. It's not just, um, in a sense, it's not just a baby being born, and we understand that. We understand it was God becoming flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. But really, if we think about it, it was, a, it was the beginning of a plan, or not a beginning of a plan, a continuation of a plan that had been activated a long time ago. The whole story of the Bible and God's plan for man is this, and I'm, simpli I'm simplifying. God created man. By the way, we're not part of evolution. We're not some type of accident. We're not some result of a lightning bolt striking some uh, goofy water and poof, life came to, as is, we're creation. God created us, and all was perfect. And God had good things in mind for his creation, but Man rebelled against God. We rebelled against God by sinning. It started uh, back in the Garden of Eden with Eve and Adam taking of the fruit and disobeying God. Uh, of course, always trying to improve upon God's plan, which that just seems to be how mankind works. But really, it was rebellion against God, choosing to, to disobey God's commands and do our own thing. Because of that, man suffers the consequences. By the way, all the things that happen in this life are really a result of the fall of man, the sinfulness of man falling. And that's where all the corruption of this world came from. God created a perfect planet with perfect people. And once we sinned, all the corruption started and it's ruined life. And if we don't make, if we don't uh, uh, talk, receive what I'm going to talk about in a few minutes, then it also messes up our afterlife uh, in a very, very bad way. But God also provided a solution for our sin and for our rebellion. He pictured it in the Old Testament, the sacrifices, the prophecies, and all of those things. And it's coming to fruition with Jesus Christ coming to this earth. Then God paid for our rebellion. That's why Jesus came. Jesus came and lived a perfect life on this earth so that he could die on the cross, not that he, he was murdered on the cross. He allowed himself to be put to death on the cross to pay for our sins and for our rebellion. And because of that, he offers us eternal life. Eternal life which we forfeited by our sin. When we sinned, we gave up any opportunity or chance of going to heaven apart from God's offer of eternal life. And then he also offers us an abundant life. That is the life after we trust Christ. That is a change in our, 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 our life on this earth after our eternity has been changed by accepting Jesus Christ. But why is it that so many Christians miss out on the last part of the plan? We understand all of it, and it comes down to the salvation part, but after that, it seems like we kind of uh, deviate and uh, the wheels fall off the car. We kind of do our own thing. Some get some parts of it. We receive Christ, and we get eternal life, but when it comes to the rest of God's plan for our life, that is kind of where it ends for us. That's kind of where the text that we're going to look at this morning comes in. The book of Ephesians tells us of our riches that we possess because of Christ. If you look at Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3, a, a chapter back, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. I mean, there are eternal riches involved in that inheritance, but there are also temporal blessings involved with knowing Jesus Christ. So we should live spiritually rich lives, but most of us live spiritually poor lives. Most of us choose, uh, not most of us, I'll say most Christians choose to live spiritually poor lives when in reality they don't need to. Uh, there was a lady named Thelma Howard 
who for many years was a cook and housekeeper for Walt Disney and his family for over 30 years. She, uh, he always would give her in the early days for her birthday or Christmas, he would give her stock in, in, in Disney. And he would tell her, hang on to it. One day it's going to be valuable. And she didn't really understand the concept. And she threw all of it into a, a drawer and kind of just kept it with some papers that she had. Years after Walt Disney died, she eventually died. As her family was going through her stuff, they, they found, these, uh, they found the, the stock that she had. And this was in the mid-1980s. And so they had the stock valued, and at that time, it was valued at $4.5 million. This lady lived, lived a very, um, by very meager and frugal means, didn't have a lot of money, when the fact of the matter is, she had the resources to live in a much better way, but she did not understand that. Much like most Christians, we, we can live a spiritually better life, a more spiritually enriched life, and yet we choose to live like spiritual paupers in a sense. That is what Ephesians is trying to tell us. In chapter 1 of Ephesians, he describes what we have in Christ, our spiritual possessions. In the chapter we're going to look at, he's going to talk to us about our position in Christ. Who are we because we know Jesus Christ, and how does that change us? Ephesians 2 takes us through the progression of salvation in our life, from the beginning to the end. You say, well, what is it, a process? No, no, no. Our eternal destiny is settled that moment we meet Christ, but salvation is much more than that. God has so much more to offer us through Jesus Christ. And what I want us to see is that everything for us changed at that instant when we received Jesus Christ as our Savior. Yep. Everything was changed. Now, we may not appropriate it, we may not use but everything was changed because of Jesus Christ. At Christmas time, we're going to thank God for the birth that led to his death that gives us an opportunity to have a changed life. There's three sections of our life that we'll see here in Ephesians. I want us to see it in the few minutes we have, and then we'll be done. First of all, I want you to notice about our salvation that it changed our past. Right. Changed our past. Yep. I mean, everything about us before we were saved was not good. Yeah. And that moment we got saved, all of that in the past is now changed once and for all. Well, what are you talking about? Well, let's mention a few of those. It changed the fact that we were dead. Look at verse 1. And you, yet he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sin. Before we met Jesus Christ, we were dead in our sin. Right. Oh, but I'm alive and I'm dead. No, no, no. In, a, in, in our relationship with God, in our eternal destiny, in our eternal standing, we were dead. We weren't dying. We weren't on our, we were already dead. Right. Sometimes we say that someone without Christ, they're on their way to hell. They're, they're really, they're almost there. Yeah. Unless something drastically changed. Because spiritually, when Adam and Eve, when they said, the day you eat of the fruit, ye will die. Now let me ask you a question. Did they die the day they ate the fruit? Not physically, because he was talking about a spiritual death. Now, the seeds of physical death were sown that day in our rebellion to God, but spiritually, that day, they died, and because we are born and we sin from the very beginning, we are all dead in our sin. And before we trusted Christ, we were dead. You say, well, I come to church because I want to, it's not going to help you. Uh, many, many years ago, we started, my wife and I started a class uh, uh, probably about uh, over 20 years ago, we started a class for young couples. Pastors had to start it. And there was a young couple that started coming, and the, the, the wife was saved. And I talked to the husband many times, and I tried to talk to him about Christ, and he would not get saved. And I asked him, I, the last time I talked to him, I said, why do you come to church? He goes, because I think it'll be good for me and my family. I'm like, if you're not saved, it's not going to help you. He thought that he could be to church and he's going to hear spiritual things that are going to make a spiritual impact in his life. And fact of the matter is, he was dead in his sin. There was nothing it was going to do to help him. He needed to trust Jesus Christ. You can't grow if you're, not, you can't grow if you're dead. 
And so we were dead. We were, it was worse than that. We were deceived. Verse 2. Wherein in time past we walked according to this court, to the course of this world. The course of this world, that's, that's society. The, the principles and the way that society tells us we ought to live. And by the way, they're contrary to the word of God. It's amazing how, how much easier it is to see how things are just so contrary to common sense anymore. It is. I mean, just because someone gets up and says, I'm a girl today, and they're a guy, they're a girl. No, they're not. By the way, people are getting fired from their jobs. I heard of a doctor that got fired because biologically she was saying, they're not, it's, it's, she's a female. Okay, what's wrong with us? It's just getting worse and worse and worse. The farther we get away from Scripture, the more we buy into what society tells us, the more we're deceived. We're deceived. We were deceived. So according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, that's Satan. And the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, that's self. We were just, we were deceived and we were following everything we were hearing, everything but what God said. Thank God, if you're saved, that you no longer have to be deceived by what we're hearing all around us. Because now we're alive in Christ, and we'll get to that in a minute, and so we can see things from God's perspective, and if we're hearing something that's not true, because we know God's Word, we'll be able to say, that is a lie. Oh, yeah. We're no longer deceived. Thank God for that. By the way, uh, we, we think rebellion is kind of a cool thing, don't we? I mean, the whole world's like, oh, I, I, do, I, you know, I, I do my own thing. By the way, everybody does the same thing, but they're all doing their own thing. Yeah. By the way, you really want to be a rebel? You want to be a really good rebel? Do what God says. Yeah. That's completely foreign to what this world is doing. Yeah, yeah. But we were deceived. But it's worse. We were depraved. Look at verse 3. Among whom also we had our conversation, that means manner of life, in times past, in the lust of our flesh... We lived according to what we wanted, fulfilling the desires of the flesh, that's lust again, and of the mind. So we lived based on what we wanted, and we gave in to those things which we wanted, and fulfilled them, even though they were wrong, and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. That's not good. We lived our life basically by what we wanted. That is a really bad way to live. Well, that's just what I want. That's what I think is best. That's what will make me happy. Listen, if it's not something that God is in on, it won't make you happy. Right. If it's not something that God's, God, God is on, you may fulfill that desire, but you'll feel horrible afterwards. Then you'll suffer the consequences. We were depraved. We lived our life just doing everything we wanted to do. Do everything we wanted to do. And you know, sometimes we try to give legitimacy to that type of life by the things we say. You ever hear these phrases? I'm just being true to myself. Well, yourself is messed up. Right. Say, so how do you know that? Because myself is messed up. Okay, I have sinful f flesh. I have sinful sinful desires. And we need to be very careful about that. So just because you're being true to yourself doesn't mean you're being true to God. That's where our society is right now. Okay? And we're all out of whack. I've tried to fight it, but it's just who I am. Okay? First of all, maybe you've tried to fight it in your own power. But if you're saved, you get God's power. Amen? Well, I've always had these desires. I was born with these desires. I know, it's called sinfulness. I was born with it too. We were all born with sinful desires. But you know what? Thank God, that's the past. There, listen, I, I say often, never be, I don't like it sometimes, but never be surprised when someone who's not saved acts like someone who's not saved. You know why they act like that? Because they're not saved. But there is no sense in a Christian acting like someone who's not saved. We have the Spirit of God. Our eyes have been opened. We have the truth of God. Thank God for that. We don't have to live a depraved lifestyle. We don't have to be a slave to our sinful desires. And I'm not belittling you if you're struggling with that. And I'm not saying if you struggle with sin that you're not saved. You may be truly saved, but you just may not be following God's plan and getting in His Word and allowing God to work in your life. And we can help you with that. The Word of God can help you with that. 
So that's our past. It changed our past. But thank God it changed our present. Who we are now. I like verse 4. But God. I love when God butts in. Amen. Who is rich in his mercy for his great love wherein he loved us. Everything that God butts in and everything can be better because God loves us. God's love is not just, you know, a bumper sticker. God's love isn't just John 3, 16. God's love is very practical and it's very good for our lives. Amen. It, how did it change our present? Well, we're alive. Look at verse 5. But when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, for by grace are you saved. And he mentions being quickened several times. Quickened means to be made alive. So you have to be quick. We were completely dead in sin, and when we got saved, we are now completely alive in Christ. Amen. Alive in Christ. We are no longer dead to sin. You ever hear the phrase new life in Christ? That's where it comes from. You know, we used to talk, used to use a phrase a lot. I'm a, a, a born-again Christian. What does that mean? Uh, John chapter 3. You're born again. Your spirit, which was dead in sin, is now quickened and made alive in Christ. It changed our present. We were raised. Look at verse 6. And hath raised us up together. That pictures the resurrection. When we were dead, we were really, spiritually speaking, in the cemetery. But he didn't leave us there. Okay? He raised us up. Completely different. By the way, let me ask you this. If you want to check yourself, think this way. What is different in my life now since I've trusted Christ than before I trusted Christ? Is there any, has, has God done anything to make me different? Think about that. You say, man, I've trusted Christ, but everything seems to be the same. And I'm not talking about circumstances. Sometimes circumstances are outside of our control. Now, inside of Christ, how we handle those circumstances are, is a lot better. But what's different? Because if we're dead and now we're alive, if we're in a grave and now we're raised from the grave, that's going to be kind of uh, noticeable. If the people at your work see you and it's like the same old dead Christian or the same old dead person, they don't know anything different. Something's wrong. Yeah. Look, if I'm walking through a cemetery and someone jumps out of the grave, something different happened. Yeah. That's going to be a little bit noticeable, Okay. And I know they're dead, and now they're alive. I'm going to, okay, what happened here? Do, does anybody know that? Your, does your family, your friends, like, wow, I don't know what's going on, and I'm not saying we're being super, you know, you know uh, self-righteous, but they ought to look and say, something's going on here. What happened? Jesus Christ happened. We were raised. We're exalted. And made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, we're not exalted in a sense because of, and it's not like some proud thing, because of who we are, but because of who he is. We are with him. People talk about self-esteem. I don't need self-esteem. I need Christ's esteem. If there's anything good in you, if there's anything good in me, it's not because of you and it's not because of me. It's because of him. He's the one that made us alive. He's the one that raised us. And we are with him. And then I like this. We are enriched. Look at verse 7. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. Yes. He has just given us everything. He's went over it, exceeding grace. I mean, it's more than we could ever imagine. So it's changed our present. And then lastly, it changed our future. Our future. Well, how has our future changed? Well, we receive God's present. Verse 8, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Amen. Now, now think of it for a minute. What? Christmas, when we think about Christmas, you think of a lot of things. If you ask the kids, the kids think about presents. Oh, they like Frosty the Snowman, all that other stuff. But it's about Chris. It's about, they like the, I mean, they like all this stuff. They have family, food, whatever. They want presents. It's like, hey, we're going to do all the other stuff, but you're not getting anything for Christmas this year. Okay, that wouldn't go over very well. It's, they, they like, do you know Christmas gave us a present? That present's eternal life. And it is a present. Because you didn't pay for it. I didn't pay for it. Jesus paid for it. 
And a present must be accepted. By the way, if you're here this morning and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, if you don't have 100% complete, uh, uh, co complete confidence that you're on your way to heaven and you can give a biblical reason for it, you've not received God's present. You need to receive his present. Amen. By the way, do you know that there's a lot wrapped up in God's present? First of all, eternal life is wrapped up in God's yeah. present. If you go to heaven, it's because of Jesus and you accepted his gift and nothing else. You're not trusting in anything else. That's right. But you know, inside of that present of salvation, there's a lot of good stuff on this earth. Yeah. I mean, he wants to do something in your life now. Right. I remember when we started the church in Monterey Park, uh, Lisa Rodriguez used to go here, and she went out there to help start the church. And uh, we had our, 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 our class Christmas party. I was working at that church, too. So we had our class Christmas party. You know how you give the, the gifts where you steal from each other? I mean, it's kind of like Christian stealing or whatever. Someone has a gift, and it's like, I like that gift better. And, you know, $10 or less, right? And I remember uh, we're there, and, 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 she, and, and everybody was done, and all their gifts were done, and everybody had their little gift, either cu coffee cup or something. And uh, Lisa told one person, said, hey, look on the inside of your gift. And they're like, what, what are you talking about? So I said, oh, look on the inside of your gift. And they opened up the inside of their gift, and it wasn't just the gift she gave, and there was like a $20 bill in there that she had hidden. Okay? And that's kind of what salvation is like. We see salvation as like, my eternal destiny is changed. I'm going to heaven. That's just the start. Look inside the box. There's a lot more there. God wants to, our future is changed eternally, but our future is changed temporally too. And we need to reject our pride. Not of works, lest any man should boast. See, when we truly get saved, we realize, I had nothing to do with it. Yeah. it it's not of me. It's all of him. We will appreciate him more, and here's the deal. We'll understand ourselves more. Salvation gives us a good dose of reality. Yes, sir. I am nothing. I'm a zero. And I realize, you know, what is man that thou art mindful of him? It's like, why would you even deal with me, God? I know who I am now. By the way, if, if salvation makes you think better about your sin and yourself, you didn't really get the right kind of salvation. Paul said, I mean, I, Paul said, I'm the chief of sinners. I mean, Paul wasn't, it wasn't a false humility. Paul just said, I really understand sin from God's perspective now. And then we, it reveals God's plan. Verse 10. For we are his workmanship. And we've used this verse quite often. Workmanship means new product created in Christ Jesus. For what purpose? Unto good works. Why? Which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. You know, God's ordained that after we trust Christ that we be a new person so we can do good works. See, God not only has a plan to work in your life for your sake, he has a huge plan for to work in your life for the sake of others. What are you doing for somebody else? By the way, that is a really, that's a real uh, uh, indicator of change in your life, that you're no longer concerned about yourself, you're concerned about other people. You concerned about others? Let me just make this point, we're done. Salvation changes everything. What has it changed in your life? I hope it didn't just change your eternal address. I hope it changes everything you do on this earth right now. And let me encourage you, if you've not experienced that to the full extent, the abundant life, get in on it. It's there. It's probably, you know, you, you get a gift sometimes and you, there's a bunch of paper in it and you look, oh, hey, this. Sometimes there's extra stuff in the box. You might want to look. God wants to do something in your life. If you're not experienced that, let's get with it. Let him do something with you. That's what salvation gives us. It changes everything. Let's all stand this morning.